All right, turn with me this morning to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 10 through 14. First Peter five ten through 14. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Well, this is my first sermon in the series on 1 Peter, and it's mostly an introduction to the letter as a whole. And I thought it's helpful to get something of the big picture, or at least try to get something of the bigger picture, before we consider it section by section or paragraph by paragraph. That was the idea, and I was trying to think of a helpful way to do that when I providentially stumbled upon a 30-minute YouTube video of a man named Andrew Claven. I, I didn't know him before, but apparently he has a podcast with The Daily Wire. And on this episode, he was in conversation with Doug Wilson. And at the start of the podcast, before Clavin introduced his guest, he introduced the episode this way. These are his words. I actually copied the transcript. I talk about the culture a lot on the show and elsewhere, and I don't think there's any more important cultural issue or cultural mission than reorienting the mind of the West back toward faith. I would actually go further than that and say if the Western mind can't rediscover God with real faith, there will be no Western culture to speak of, uh, of simply a re and simply a return to the bloody and oppressive paganism of old which is where I think we're almost at today. It's a little bit ironic because there's been plenty of blood and oppressive uh, semi-paganism in the West throughout the years, but that's not my interest this morning. When Doug Wilson came on, Clavin said to him, I have to say as I look at our culture right now, if it hasn't hit bottom, it's getting pretty close. It's a very ugly moment in our culture. A lot of things have returned. Racism has become fashionable again. The absolute disregard for the lives of unborn children, the attacks on sexual ethics, and on just on the fact that there are two genders, all these things, what is the role of a Christian in a moment like this? And there it was, the way I was looking for to introduce this first Peter series. It's right there in that closing question. What is the role of a Christian in a moment like this? Now, if I were the guest, here's how I would answer that question. In a moment like what? And if he looked baffled, I would probably follow it up with something like this. Why are you so preoccupied with how unbelievers think and live and act 
in what the Bible calls this present evil age. In other words, it's like stepping outside a weather station in Antarctica or in Overland Park, <laughs> but we'll keep it at Antarctica in case anyone watches this video during the summertime. It'd be like stepping outside a weather station in Antarctica and saying, what are we going to do about this brutally cold weather? As if an unexpected cold front had just swept into Antarctica, and otherwise the climate is balmy and even tropical. And that brings me to Clavin's most important cultural mission, reorienting the mind of the West back toward faith. Well, there's an easy job for you. And I think that might be likened to bringing Miami weather to Antarctica. How do you bring the Western mind, whatever that may be, because there's hardly any single mind, back toward faith? What kind of faith? Monotheistic faith? Theism? Deism? What kind? And as for the question, what is the role of a Christian in a moment like this? If Peter were the guest, I think he would say something like, I've, I've already answered that for you. Haven't you read my first epistle? What do you think it's about? Because Peter and his Christians actually lived in a moment like this, and it appears that the believers weren't entirely prepared for it. In chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says to them, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. I think Western Christians are actually surprised that unbelievers are acting like, uh, what word could I use? Unbelievers people that Paul describes in quite a bit of detail as dead in their trespasses and sins, as slaves to sin, as those who follow the dark powers of the air, who by nature are children of wrath. As it turns out, for Peter, moments like this are normal life in the world. There's nothing exceptional about where we are in the course of world history. And as if to prove that point, and this is going to be important, throughout the letter, which has everything to do with a suffering then glory church, which is why I started at the end of the book. How does Peter sum up the letter? What's his final word? After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. For Peter, this isn't a strange wind that's blown in the culture. He associates the Christian experience of the world and in the world directly to Jesus Christ. Because during his earthly pre-resurrection life, Jesus experienced the world just as the Christians are experiencing it in 1 Peter, and by extension I would say just as Christians experiencing, experience the world everywhere in every age. This is no coincidence. And it's also not something that was confined to sort of the, just the opening 
days of gospel living in the early church as if in some way Peter had in mind, look, this is, we're in that tough, let's ride it out together stage uh, that all new religions have to endure when they begin, but eventually we'll be large enough to take the reins of power and we'll show them who's boss. If that were the teaching of the Bible, then First Peter would merely be an artifact of the early church and not the living, abiding, breathing, life-giving instruction from the risen Christ through his apostle. It is not an artifact. It is God's own word. First spoken, to be sure, in a cyclical letter that made the rounds in Asia Minor. I don't know how many churches received a copy of this letter, but just like any other letter in the New Testament, it's finally reached us in our own tongue in the modern world, but it's lost nothing along the way. And to finish off this line drawing I've been doing over the past few sermons, I just want to remind you that we've traced Jesus, the Savior King, from his humble start in a Bethlehem stable to his presence in, of all places, the heavenly realm, as of all things, a slain lamb. So when Peter wrote, and he wrote this probably from Rome, there's debate healthy debate about when he might have written this, but when he wrote this to these believers, he could say to them that Jesus Christ has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. And if that's not clear enough, because he's referring to Psalm 110, he adds this, he is seated at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. And I think we're well within our rights to reason it out this way. If angels, authorities, and powers are subject to him, then so is Rome and Caesar. And while we're at it, so is the United States and its government and its culture. And so is this thing called the Western mind. Now, we'll return to angels and authorities and powers further on. But Clavin and Wilson, their discussion, and I'm not trying to beat up on anybody. It was a very winsome conversation. Well, they would hate me for saying that. They don't like winsome. They like sarcastic, in your face, uh, take no prisoners Christianity. At least Wilson does. Um, but as they discussed our degrading culture, uh, it helps me to introduce what First Peter is teaching in another important way. And this is very important. When they, or really any Western Christians in general, lament a, quote, moment like this in our culture, what they're really doing is they are presupposing a narrative. That is, they are assuming that we are in and are a part of a larger story. Please, please hold on to that because it, they illustrated that for me so nicely. When they lament this moment, a moment like this one, they are assuming that we, all of us, are in and are a part of an existing story. That should be obvious, right? In other words, 
if we've sunk so low as a culture, then that presupposes we were once higher as a culture. If a lot of things have returned, that's a reference to history, and racism has become fashionable again, then apparently there was a time recently when racism and other evils were more diminished and subdued. So what these are are story beliefs. Story beliefs. This is so very important to understanding First Peter and really the whole Bible. And in this belief, outlining it very broadly, Western culture began at a specific time. It developed in both space and time. Along the way, it was infused with the Bible and Christianity and a belief in one God. And it was making forward progress in its host cultures. That's the story. And this narrative arc brought extraordinary benefits to humanity in every area of life that we consider meaningful. The arts, religion, science and technology, human government, and so on and so forth. If you're not religious, then you're probably going to give most of the credit to the Enlightenment, and maybe more credit than the Enlightenment deserves. If you are religious, then you're probably going to give more credit to Western Christianity, and maybe more than Western Christianity deserves. But Westerners across the religious and philosophical spectrum share the same overarching narrative about the West. They may debate the details like mad, and without straying too far into the academy, now even some of the most basic beliefs about Western culture have been not only called into question, but have been or at least attempt to be refuted. But for the most part, historically, there is this overall history that we could all agree on. And in case you're wondering, a personal word, I deeply appreciate Western culture, warts and all. And I would expect all of its warts because I believe primarily in the Bible's view of the fallenness of humanity. But I cherish the story of Western civilization at this sort of basic horizontal level as a quality of life in the world. I would rather live in Kansas than in Tehran. Yes, I would. And if you want to read something good on this question, I recommend, because it was not only well-researched, but it's very accessible, Jonah Goldberg's little book, Suicide of the West. And what attracted me to Goldberg's book was on the very first page, he said, we're going to have this conversation, and we're not going to say anything about God. I thought, good. This is the way to engage the world as private citizens. They don't care about God. But there are arguments to be made for the privilege of living in Western civilization. And they don't depend ultimately on some view that the United States or the West in its entirety is a new Israel. Goldberg's not an atheist, but he thought, how am I going to, I'm arguing this on the merits more on than this biblical idea that we can return the Western mind to faith. So I hope you have that down. These debates about Western culture and its relationship to God assume a story. 
a narrative that's been going on now, depending how you measure it, for thousands of years. But Peter has a better story, one that he can trace all the way back to a man named Abram, who was an idolater who lived in the city of Ur in the Chaldeans, among the Chaldeans. And as 1 Peter shows, Jesus' apostle, his, his first leader of the church, Peter, has incorporated former Gentiles into that story. Well, we can call it Israel's story. We can call it the history of redemption. But what he's done is, it's as if he's opened up the gates and said, come on in. There's a bigger story here that you didn't even know was taking place. And so God ultimately, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, has absorbed us into Israel's story and as a result has given us a new identity. Once you were not a people, Peter says in chapter 2, verse 10, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And that's how Peter actually begins the epistle. In verse 3 of chapter 1, he says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now I'll have more to say about that story, of course, but also how fundamental story is to every aspect of our human identity. As we'll see, it informs how we live, how we move, and how we have our being in this world. And stories are universal. That is, wherever you go in the world, whether in larger cultures or in tribes, you will inevitably discover that this group of people has a story so that it can explain its existence in the world and try and develop a sense of meaning and purpose. This explains why Doug Wilson, for example, feels so strongly about redirecting the church toward a mission of national moral reform and why this mission of national moral reform doesn't very obviously rise up out of First Peter. So that's a framework. Those are some basic principles for understanding that we'll employ as we go forward. And for the time remaining, I want us to look at some essential elements of our new story as a way to get into 1 Peter. It is an epistle, but even as an epistle, there is a narrative dimension to it because Peter is building on an existing story. We've just come into it a bit late, that's all. At the most basic level, the stories that people groups tell answer these famous universal questions. I would say everybody I've ever talked to who was in any way sensible is probably asking these questions, whether they're doing it out loud and in a way where they're seeking answers or whether it's kind of going
going along uh, like a something in the background of your computer, an operating system. But we want to know, who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? How should we live? And where are we going? I'm going to repeat those. Fergio, my cat, never asks these questions. We do. Who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? How should we live? And where are we going? All of those questions are interconnected. And I wouldn't say that one is more important than the other. Though the last question, we discussed this in Sunday school this morning, where are we going? means we all need an eschatology. There has to be something in the future that makes what we're experiencing in the present meaningful and worthwhile. Now, I wanted to make sure I had my questions right, so I looked it up on the internet. I thought I had them right, but I wanted to double check. And interestingly, and somewhat I ironically, the way it was presented is the way many modern Western people would present it. They substituted the word we with the word I. Now everything is personal and private. That's how Western people think. Why am I here? Where did I come from? How should I live? So to, to step back for a minute, We've got these questions going. If it helps you to imagine it, think of a conversion to Christianity like it was entering the witness protection program. It's, it's a silly illustration, but it's, it kind of gets at the point. You are now, courtesy of the federal government, a new person with a new name, a new home, and a new story, even perhaps a new backstory. And the immediate challenge for you as someone in the witness protection program is to accept and adapt to this new reality, to embrace your new backstory where life's universal questions have been definitively answered including the where are we going story. That's the challenge, to embrace, accept and embrace your new identity and to work it into your whole system in such a way that it becomes your reality. This is what Peter's up to so that when we come back to that ending passage, he says, in order to summarize the letter, right? That's why we're not gonna preach it backward. We go to the end to see where is this headed? If Peter had just a few words to tie off his communication, what words would he use? Because we might find in those words a way to get into the letter and get a summary of it. And he says this, and after you have suffered a little while, uh-oh, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have, re I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. What must you do with it? Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. This is how Peter sums up the main thrust, the main point of his letter. That yes, 
Christians throughout Asia Minor, God most certainly will finish what he began. Even if that calling to his new world, which is his eternal glory in Christ, that's not dying and going to heaven. Even if this calling to his new world seems to have hit a bit of a scary dead end. And that's what's happening in chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has caused us to be born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It's wonderful. You know, come on. It's just incredible. God's great mercy. Look what he's done for us, right? It's not just God forgave your sins. You've been born again to an inheritance. We'll see what that is as we continue. And even now you're being guarded by God's power for a salvation ready to be revealed, meaning it exists already. It just needs to be uncovered in the last time. In this you rejoice. And we're going, yes, Peter, we do rejoice in this. Thank you. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. Okay, we weren't expecting that bit. This is where the consolation and exhortation, where the true grace of God is explained. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You're obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What kind of salvation is this, brothers and sisters? Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, Christians in Asia Minor, Parkwood's Presbyterian Church, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. So what does this call for? It seems like we've kind of hit a, a bit of a scary dead end. We, we weren't sure about this trials thing and suffering. Could this be some strange bait and switch of a religion that promises one thing to get you in? And then afterwards, like the guy selling condos says, oh, by the way, there's something I forgot to say, the bad part. Maybe this is like Laban giving Leah to Jacob and then saying, well, yeah, the Rachel thing, that's still going on. Just give me another seven years. So when Peter writes at the end, after you have suffered a little while, he's basically echoing you have been grieved by various trials. So in 512, 
This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. That corresponds to verse 13. If everything that Peter wrote in verses 1 through 12 is true, what follows that? Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That corresponds to that stand firm in it. This is what this is what this moment in our culture calls for. Standing firm as the King James had it gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. I thought we could just be giddy and just be religiously enthusiastic for the duration, that the fount of many blessings would overflow so that we experienced our best life now. Peter says, mm, no, no, you, that's part of your new identity, S sorry. And finally, in verse 14, excuse me, verse 13, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. That answers 1, 1 through 4. You are the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You are the elect exiles. This is called an inclusio where the end of the book answers how the book begins. That's the central theme of the epistle. It's part of your new identity in the Witness Protection Program. You are a part of God's return from exile. You are part of God's new exodus. This is the true grace of God. Do you want the true grace of God? If you do, then stick around. Because Peter is referring back to everything that he's written so far from chapter 1, verse 1. So it can't come down to just the bits that we like and overlooking the bits that we don't or the bits that line up with our Protestant belief system versus the bits that are harder to explain. I like the bit where Peter reflects on Christ's service to God and to us when he explains Jesus' suffering and death against the backdrop of Isaiah 53. That's where he took our sins to the tree in his own body. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Love that. But what led Peter to reflect on Jesus' relationship to Isaiah's suffering servant? Well, it comes just a few verses earlier. He's addressing slaves who were not only powerless by virtue of their slavery, but who were suffering unjustly. That is, they were behaving as well as any slave would and could, but they were still being treated badly. He says to those slaves, for to this you have been called. Why? because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footprints. That brings him to Isaiah 53. But look how he got there. You've been called to this too, because Christ suffered for you, and now you walk in his footsteps. Now, this in turn mustn't be divorced from, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, 
who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, right? But that's the whole package, both sides of it. And both these things assume the return from exile, new exodus identities that Peter has assigned to his Christians. He's put them into a story that is even more certain because we have the prophetic word, the apostolic word, and the dominical word, that is the words of Christ, to confirm it. I'm not sure if the story of Western civilization is all that its interpreters say that it is. It may be, but I have no prophetic word. I have no apostolic word. I have no dominical word that it is. It's just a nice way to live. Peter has all of that on his side. So that we have a story that is more certain and sure than the story of Western civilization. We don't know what God has planned for the West, so we have no certainty about that. And those who make its preservation their Christian mission seem to neglect Peter's rather ominous statement in 417, which may be, in this conversation about saving the culture, one of the more overlooked verses in the Bible for it is time, says Peter, for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Huh. Could it be, and this is just a thought experiment, that the decline in the culture morally and spiritually and otherwise is actually judgment on the house of God to purify it. There's temple imagery there, as we'll see. We don't think that way because we put ourselves naturally on the, the heights in the moral battles. But Peter says, oh, it's kind of funny, isn't it? The judgment starts where? With you Christians. And isn't that exactly what's happening in the seven churches in Revelation? Jesus comes to those churches and he doesn't say, one day when we get Rome, none of this will be happening to you. He says to them, you guys aren't doing very well, are you? And a few of you probably won't be here for the next round of letters. Well, wait a minute, Jesus, you're talking, you're talking to us, the warriors, the guys in the world who are standing up for righteousness. Jesus isn't impressed. First century slaves, like the ones Peter speaks to, knew nothing about Western civilization or its survival, but they took God at his word when he pledged that their inheritance was being kept in heaven for them, even as they were being guarded by God himself, and that was consolation to grind out an unpleasant and unjust existence in the homes of their masters. We have famous sayings in the Western Church. One of my favorites is Luther's brilliant axiom that Christians are simultaneously righteous and sinful. The insight there, even if he didn't get all the eschatology, was, it was bold, it was original, and it was profound. But that has a, an emphasis on personal salvation. Luther was better than that. I don't mean to imply otherwise. But I think Luther, as the hero of the Reformation, we talked about this in Sunday school actually, produced something inadvertently that has impeded Christian self-understanding. Peter knows that the best way for Christians to see themselves 
was to take both to mind and to heart their collective identity. That's why he can address us with the same identity all together. Who are you people? Well, you're resident aliens in a land that's not hospitable to you. You're in Babylon, but you're also coming out of it and you're entering God's new world. If we slice that up into pieces, we are in a particularly dangerous position because that makes us all alone in a world where, how does he put it? Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You ever watch nature documentaries? When the, when the lions go on the hunt, who do they target in the herd? The one that's falling behind is all by him or herself or someone who might be limping a little bit or one of the children. What's the best defense that those antelopes and all those other really kind of dopey creatures have? Stay together, stay together. <clears throat> Our collective identity is, says Peter, that together you are the true and final Israel. You Gentile converts throughout Asia Minor are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The journey to the inheritance involves suffering for a little while. But the Lord Jesus himself endured the same in order to secure one that is imperishable undefiled and unfading and God guards us and keeps that inheritance with himself in heaven we're only waiting for it to be revealed let's pray our father as always we thank you for your word in the way that it comes to us, challenging us, consoling us, encouraging us, shaping and molding us, all of this, the work of Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit. And we pray that we may be, well, that we may be as wet clay, ready to be shaped and molded, not by any of the passing philosophies or the passions of earthly people, but by the living and abiding word of God in the hands of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to submit ourselves genuinely to the word so that we may hear it well and embrace it and consider seriously the ways in which we can work it out in our common experience as the people of God. It's hard to remember that we once were not a people, but now we're your people. And we pray that by embracing that identity, not only are the great questions of life answered for us, but the one that may be the most pertinent is, all right, how shall we live? Teach us to live well and under the approval of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord, in whose name we pray, amen.
I read the same words of institution almost every single week. <clears throat> because we read the words of Jesus Christ as a way to separate from ordinary use the bread and the wine. But you'll notice that when I read the words of institution, I am not reading from the Augsburg Confession or the Westminster Shorter Catechism, certainly not from the Council of Trent. I'm reading from a story. And this is where our participation in the story first began. It began on the night when our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed. The story, by human reckoning, should have ended there. You know, betrayal, arrest, serious torture, a trial, more torture, and then crucifixion. But Jesus rose from the dead, and we rose with him. That's what it means to have a living hope, to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So this is now our story, or an important part of it, the night when Jesus was betrayed, when he took bread and when he took the cup and shared it with those who would make up the, the, the pillars of his new people in the world. And so as we come to the Lord's table, doesn't it in its own way draw us into this existing story? The roots of the Last Supper are in the Passover, a very long-standing story. But it also reminds us that it's after we suffer for a little while because when we do so, we are repeating the life of Jesus in this realm in order that we might experience his life in the age to come. So if you're a Christian this morning, this meal not only reminds you of all the benefits of citizenship in the kingdom of God, that God in his great mercy has bestowed upon you in Christ. It also contains a hint that all may not be well and comfortable in the short term, but just as Jesus did, we have the long term in mind. And that's how we're like him. So Christians come, not only to be taught, but to be strengthened for this suffering for a little while part. And if you're not a Christian this morning, then you're not a participant in the work of Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you to stay away from the supper, but you may ask one of us about the hope that lies within us. So let's enjoy our fellowship with the risen Lord at the meal that he's prepared for us. <clears throat> Thank mm -hmm. you.